Selling a little or a lot? Shopify helps you do your thing however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage. All the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage. Shopify is there to help you grow. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Get a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash work. Shopify.com slash work. Peloton encourages you to get moving by doing what you can. That's why they have thousands of instructors who motivate you from day one with thousands of classes for all levels to get you started. If that's a 10-minute low-impact ride, let's go. A 20-minute climb, go for it. Because doing something is everything. Get started with a Peloton bike or Bike Plus rental at onepeloton.com slash bike slash rentals. Terms apply. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, Right. For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Hello there. Thank you for visiting with me today. I'm Sarah Wendell. This is Smart Podcast Trash Your Books, episode number 604. My guest is Katie Robert. We are going to talk about her many, many, many book releases this year. We're going to talk about marketing through Kickstarter and direct-to-reader options like Patreon and about the foundational books in fantasy and romance that got her started. I will have links to all of the books that we mention in the podcast show notes and on smartbitchestrashybooks.com slash podcast under episode number 604. Hello and thank you to our Patreon community. Keep me going. You make sure the show is supported and happy and has a lovely transcript compiled by Garlic Knitter. Hello, Garlic Knitter. If you join the Patreon, you get some lovely benefits. We have a wonderful Discord community and you get bonus episodes. We would love to have you. And speaking of, I have a compliment to Kathy O. Your friends think that talking to you is like walking into a warm home on a cold night with wonderful dinner waiting and the perfect music as you eat. Thank you for being such a good person. If you would like a compliment of your own or you'd like to support the show, your support would mean a great deal. Monthly pledges start at $1 a month and you can see all of the benefits and tiers at patreon.com slash smartbitches. A special hello to Sarah Jane, who is one of the newest members of our community. And now it's time for a podcast. Sounds good, right? On with my conversation with Katie Robert. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, and no, I'm excited. I've been a fan of the podcast forever, so <laughs> I'm always oh. happy to show up. Oh, thank you. Your uh, episode where we talked about um, Kickstarters is one of my most popular. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, it's it pleases me greatly to see more romance authors utilizing that platform because I think we were a little underserved on there a couple of years ago and we're making our corner known. <laughs> Well, I think what's really smart about the way that you have approached Kickstarter with Melody is that you make it very clear that this is not just the book. All right, I'm going to call it something really corny. I think of it as physical lore. So it's not the lore of the book and it's not swag. It is physical lore about the books and the series that connects. Like it's all, it's all very smart. Like I'm all extremely impressed over here. As time goes on, are increasingly aware that people have so much stuff. And so in order for them to want more things, you have to make it feel valuable in a way that's not just like, here's some swag. And so that's kind of the goal with each of these campaigns is like, here's this like immersive experience we're trying to provide for you. It's very interesting. I don't know. It's We're doing something a little different this time, like with the one that's going to launch this year. And I'm really excited to see how people respond. (laughs) Can I get a sneak preview? We only did secrets on the first one. And now I can just like tell secrets. So um, we're looking at just like, more like, again, um, stationary set that's like, again, like that subtle branding, that it's like, if you know, you know, cool, but it's not, you know, romance in your face for people who don't necessarily want that. Yep. Um, 
we're kind of cutting down on some of the options for like, like there's still going to be a book sleep, but it's just one design. So people don't have to be like, I can't choose. I feel like we kind of, yeah. And we've priced people out in the past. And like, I don't want to do that mm-hmm. if at all possible so that people can get the things they want. Um, We're still, we're looking at some really interesting options. We had, we don't have anything finalized yet because we've done this thing where we're like, can you make this glass with the rose in the bottom and the, our retail or our vendors are like, I don't, maybe, maybe we can do that. So hopefully. <laughs> um, and then of course we're continuing with the vellum because it's one of my favorite things in the entire world. <laughs> what do you love about it? I just, it's, I love character art and the increasing popularity of character art makes me happy because like I'm such a visual person but the vellum in particular, just being able to have that like immersive feeling of the scene, like that the words are still there. And you're like, it's, it's one step sideways from like an illustrated romance novel that, mm-hmm. you know, people do do periodically, but I would love to be more common. <laughs> and it's hidden inside, right? Like if you have that yes. little insert, if you don't know it's there, then it's like a surprise. Exactly, exactly. And so we'll be doing the not safe for work because we... We found this printer on the first the first year just on a, a random thing that we were looking for somebody who could drop ship stuff in an envelope, which a lot of places don't do. They want to drop ship like a postcard. And so um, this guy, Charlie Steele with Modern Postcard, I will shout him out till the end of days. He was just like, okay, cool. Like what else you guys got? And so through this long relationship that we developed, we're like, are you okay with like not safe for work? Because we're bumping up against increasingly stringent guidelines about nudity or sensuality or sexuality. And it's it's frustrating frustrating from a creative standpoint. It's also worrisome from like just a societal standpoint. Yeah. It's just it's cre- it's art. Yeah. It's it's I could see if it but regardless. And so he's like, Well, it's it's art. We don't censor art. And I'm like, you are my favorite person here, here it is. And he's like, cool, great. Here, we got this thing for you. So he's he's kind of become my go-to for postcards as well because a lot of, you know, the postcard companies are not down with anything that they feel is too explicit, which, again, is becoming increasingly stringent and it's a bummer. So modern postcard authors hook Charlie Steele. Her Charlie Steele will hook you up. <laughs> That's awesome. And it's funny because it's it's almost coming full circle. Like right now you're doing art in an envelope. But postcards have been a foundationary part of promo since forever. Yes, yes. And I I do, for my Patreon, they get art prints with, because um, I am a ADHD monster. And so I'm like, I need dopamine. Let's book art. And uh, so whatever art I book in between book releases, it all gets compiled and sent to them with the physical book releases. And then they get access to like visual to digital art in the meantime. Um, and, but yeah, that like, just that little like four by six art, art prints. We can't call them postcards. Cause if you call them postcards, it can get a little gnarly with like, if there's nudity, Yeah, please don't send them as postcards. Yeah. I will get in trouble. <laughs> but um, yeah. So I send like art cards out and I, it's just such a, it has always brought me joy as a reader. So it's, it seems like it continues to bring my readers joy. So as long as that happens, I will continue doing it. That's so awesome. Well, let me back up because one of the things your publicist asked me to talk to you about was all of your releases because you have a few. Uh, you know, you got like a, like a, like a, a solid half dozen, I think. I definitely kind of lean into the Alexander Hamilton, right? Like you're running out of time thing. I don't know how to slow down. I continue to say, I'm going to slow down this year. I'm going to dial back to six releases with, instead of 10, which is, I to be fair, was on an indie release schedule for a really long time, for several years. And I'm not the greatest at targeted promo and advertising because as I said, ADHD, like I can, I can then dial it in for 30 days maybe. And then I wander off and all my ads lose money and it's bad. So I, instead of beating my head against that wall, I, I naturally write fast. And so I just decided that I'm just going to keep putting out books and eventually something will happen hopefully. And it's worked out, but it's not a sustainable pace. And so I'm, (laughs) I'm trying to slow down, which is like, other authors bananas pants scheduling so i 
the goal is to get to three books a year. That's the goal. It's not going to happen for the next couple of years. But your goal is to get two only three books yes. a year yes. instead of like six. I th- yeah, I think I'm at like, if we don't count re-releases, because several of my publishers are re-releasing, or mm-hmm. one of my publishers is re-releasing my Mafia series mm-hmm. under like new titles and to match the current branding. And then I just sold print rights for Wicked Villains to source books. So those will be getting re-releasing starting this fall. Um, so if we don't count those, I'm at about six. <laughs> that's, that's a lot. I am amazed that my readers show up for that many because it's like, there's so many other authors to read and yeah, but I'm, I'm very privileged that I'm able to do this full time, which, yeah. you know, it's, I have a, an indie book coming out, a sapphic, um, succubus and human ro- monster romance, in april and then in may i have another sapphic book coming out that is uh selkie and a vampire it's a morality chain romance it's some of the most fun i've had so writing. that's the succubus's prize and then you're talking about blood on the tide the morality yes, chain. blood on the tide yes yeah. yes it's heavily inspired the relationship or dynamic in blood on the tide is heavily inspired by a tumblr post i saw many years ago that was talking about the animal bride trope in various folklore and mythology and whatnot, and how Selkies tend to be victims and waiting in a lot of ways with like a lot of their folk stories. Whereas swans are scary and terrifying and territorial and protective. And like, can you imagine like the swan shifters realizing that a Selkie had their skin stolen by a human. And then like, they go and like beat up the person and take the skin back. And so like this, this idea of this like aggressive protective, individual and then my selkie is not really a pushover but she is somewhat traditional in some ways and so kind of my twist on the selkie story with a murderous vampire in the mix (laughs) as you do yes as you do that is a lot and i remember when you were going on tour last year that you were like oh my gosh this is so overwhelming but it also seems to me that for you the best form of continuous promo is new books Yes, absolutely. And I, because I mean, I've been doing this full time since like 2012. So I'm ancient in romance years or publishing years rather. Um, Me too. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, you you ever get that feeling (laughs) like you're sitting on the front porch of the romance old phone? Oh, are we talking about whether or not audiobooks count as reading again? Right. Oh, let me get my drink. (laughs) Like old author shakes fist at cloud. That is me a lot of times. Um, It's, it's so... But I think that a lot of, especially within like the indie community, there can be this focus on marketing. And a lot of times the best marketing is to write the next book. Like, especially if you don't have necessarily the resources or the knowledge or the interest in doing a lot of those marketing things. I've certainly found it to be true that with each book releasing, I find new readers. Yeah. And which never ceases to like humble me that I'm like, oh, you're still picking up these books. Thank you. (laughs) And it also seems to me from the outside, as I'm not actively working as an author, I'm more of a blogger, reviewer, podcaster, person who runs her mouth. It seems to me that a lot of the marketing advice for authors right now at this particular time in February, 2024, is I will give you instructions on how to game the existing systems. Or even, even more accurately, it's probably... I will give you the correct advice on how to game the system that has already been gamed three times before you got here. And here's the base system, but that doesn't work anymore. Yes. That sounds exhausting. Yes. And I find it's also really hard to tell like who's giving valuable information and who's being essentially a coach. Like, yes. can I use coach in a derogatory form as far as like, if this person is making their money off teaching versus making their money off selling, then is their advice legitimate? Sometimes it is, but a lot of times not so much. Um, And it's just, it's incredibly overwhelming. And it's, it's not every author has the same set of strengths as far as when it comes to just like how you run your career. And I think that it's incredibly disingenuous for a lot of these coach type individuals giving advice to be like, this is the way to do it. When, it might again it, it we're gaming the system that's been gamed every time you turn around there's some new thing happening that's like is this bad is this good are we on the forefront of a cutting edge technology or are we all about to lose our shirts mm-hmm. 
in this case, Spotify. Like oh, dear God. Spotify is the topic of the week. Um, and it's it's hard. It's hard to know because a lot of times we're dealing with like technology or things or stuff that's never been done before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so being a first adopter can really bite you in the ass sometimes. Oh, and God. It's, it's really frustrating for new authors because I feel like a lot of times it's like, oh, well, you just do this. It's like, okay, but like, when did you start publishing? Was it in 2012? Was it in 2015? Yeah. Like it's a completely different game now, and it's a you can't completely give different that game than last quarter. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and also, it's really hard when the only good advice is here's how to game the system, because all of these massively, massively powerful monolithic companies don't have to do shit for you because they control all of these elements, like Spotify, and and that's specifically you're referring to their contract language and find a way. Uh, taking a lot more rights than it should be. And in this is, in a lot of cases, a terms of service that people agree to without fully realizing what they're surrendering here. Yeah, uh, like, um, for those who are not aware, spot, I, I'm curious, they, they, they sound like they're going to try to walk it back, but I don't know if they're trying to walk it back or just explain it away, like, the jury's out. But uh, Spotify, I or believe, no bought, those. Voices. I mean, it could be both, right? Anyway. It could be both. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Spotify bought Find Away Voices, I believe. And so they're like, oh, we're just doing our blanket. We're updating terms and services. And a lot of people are just like, how often do various terms and services get updated? That we never look at like a lot. How much time do you need in your life to read all the terms and services that get put in front of you? What? How often do we even understand, even if we try to read them? <laughs> And so Spotify, like some authors went in and read it and were like, this is incredibly predatory. And and it is, it's like, it's like to derivative work, works, like to all sorts of stuff that they should not, it's a rights grab. It's a straight up rights grab. And so enough people were talking about it that find a way, shut down the ability to delete your books on find a way. So now there's like a rush on the bank going on that people are like, take down my books right now. We'll see if, if it actually changes them. I feel like the people up top, and this is true with traditional publishing as well. Like the people up top who make the money decisions and like some of these policy changes have no real knowledge of how that actually works in the real world. <laughs> um, it's just not, it's, I mean, we saw it with the um, Penguin Random House trial with uh, Simon and Schuster or versus the US or whatever that was. Who knows how know, books vibes. become seller? It's just vibes. I mean, that's why the company is named Random. Are you kidding me? Why would we you just piss- hand out? We just hand out six figure deals. It doesn't mean it's going to be a success. I'm like, oh. I feel like a lot of authors would really love one of these six figure deals, but okay. <laughs> Are you kidding? It's yeah. It's it's just a wild wild industry and sometimes I feel like I'm in a cult of like if you try to explain it to somebody who's not familiar with it they're like are you okay yeah like, do you need help oh like, yeah and then there's there's Amazon who has allegedly this this kills me like ale- allegedly Amazon is like you can't tell anybody about this so what do people do they tell everybody about this Amazon is now releasing AI audiobook narration as an option for people to have audiobooks produced cheaply now I will say, I have been looking into ways to have the arcs that I get, which are digital galleys before publication. I'm looking at ways to have those arcs read to me because, um, you know, since I'm going to say since like last fall, I haven't been able to read. I can listen, but reading my brain's like, nope, 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 nope. And so I got to, I got to roll with my brain. But as you know, I get a lot of things in advance. So I was looking into having various AI options, read me arcs none of them are are good. Like even the most expensive one, I was like, I can tell that this is a computer. Like I can tell it's not the same. It doesn't work for I, me. I mean, it's the same with like visual art or, you know, they're trying to train it to write books. Like I don't think, yeah, no, it, it's somebody, I think it was on Twitter before Twitter fully just sh- um, was like it's kind of like trying to spot the fae like yes! something's wrong with this person <laughs> like how many fingers um, do they have and you see the ai like on facebook for some reason i keep getting served floor plans and pictures of cozy interiors and i'm like those stairs go into a wall <laughs> yeah right it's getting better but uh, one way that it's still like at this point has not caught up is that if you look at how the clothing's constructed yes. a lot of times it's really like why is there a boat like that doesn't make sense yep. The art is heart. 
like it's our human existence and like there may come a time when that's something that can be replicated by computers but i think we're a bit longer off than a lot of people are afraid of right now yeah and also it, it, it's amazing to me because you know Amazon has lots and lots of money to invest in this and you know that they've crunched all the numbers and been like, this is a place where we could make money because it is expensive to have an audio produced by a, a human. That is an expensive prospect. I don't remember exactly when it was, but um, commission on eBooks used to be 8% and they dropped it down to 4%. I want to say that might've been like 2014, 2013, somewhere in there. It's been a while, but I basically was like, look, everyone takes a turn in the Amazon toilet. They're going to shit on you. And every company that is doing all of these like weird power grabs for rights or AI or, you know, the the ability to own own rights that you haven't offered, that's that's just going to continue. It's very, you're right. It is kind of like being in a cult. Yeah. And it's just, it's, I mean, we're late state capitalism is what it is. It's just, we got the our capitalist overlords and it's just trying to game the system to continue on. And, and it's really frustrating on some level because we don't have collective bargaining power as indies. No. And whereas like my traditional books, like they can be put up, like I could probably publish or they could probably publish with relatively risque covers and like Amazon wouldn't blink, but like you show a little bit of thigh now on an indie cover and that you get flagged as like all sorts of stuff. So it's, it's it sucks that we don't have collective bargaining power and i don't know how to fix that and i don't think that i think as a community we're a bit too scattered because there will always be people who like don't care who are just like i'm gaming the system it's fine it's incredibly frustrating (laughs) because amazon's so fickle (laughs) yes it's all fickle and then there's the people who are like no you're taking away my opportunity to make money by telling people how to do this thing that doesn't actually work yes which is frustrating But one of the things that's so interesting to me about your career is how many different venues you have found to basically go direct to consumer. You have cultivated a readership that knows to look for you and engage directly with you in terms of, do you want the stuff straight from me? Here, you have a Patreon. You have all of your Kickstarters. Like you have cornered like part of the direct to consumer market. It's partially because I was primarily small press and traditional up until about 2018 2019 and mm-hmm. then the market swung to rom-coms and i tried to write a rom-com thank god i didn't sell because it was it's just not it's not my wheelhouse so it's like i can't pay my bills i have put all my eggs in this one basket and now this basket dried up and overturned and i'm in trouble and so it's kind of that mentality of like all the eggs and all the baskets like where can i carve out a space that's just like multiple stream streams are revenue. And Patreon actually came about because of the O'Malley series, the six book, people had kept being like, we want to know what this couple's doing. We want to know, like, can you write a check in? And I'm like, I can't do that for free. Like I cannot do, I cannot, like we give away so much free content in romance. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but I have bills to pay. Mm -hmm. And so how it originally started was like, you get to vote on a character or couple or circumstance or whatever, and I'll write you a short every month. And I did that for several years and slowly kind of built out, like occasionally I made missteps and had to like dial back. Uh, Now it's shifted in the last year because I am kind of burnout on a number of things. And so I, I would just, I expected people to flee in droves. But I was like, look, like, here's, I'm going to start, I'll, I'm going to serialize my dessert projects, which is like the projects I do that are just purely for joy or or my indie projects. And people are just down with it. It's, they're just happy to be there. They're happy to get behind the scenes looks. They're really interested in my process, which is so deeply chaotic. And then I also send them uh, new release paperbacks as they come out. So they don't even have to like think about it. Like if they don't want to, as long as they're an active patron on that month, they will get the book. I also send audiobooks now that Book Funnel does audiobooks. So it, it made it easy to actually give those to people. And like a small swag box, which I keep saying I'm going to stop doing because it feels silly, but people are there and they they want it. And so they get it. <laughs> and it also creates an opportunity for you to say, this is how the 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 revenue works. This is how the, the sausage is actually funded, let alone made. And I remember N.K. Jemison was one of the pioneers of using Patreon because she's like, look, you want books. I have bills. This is how much I need per month to write books full time. 
here is the Patreon. And I think it was funded in less than a few hours. Yeah, well, and T. Kingfisher, Ursula Vernon also has, I'm on her Patreon. And it's not like she gives particularly a ton of content on any given day or week or whatever, but mm-hmm. it's it's just, it's consistent. And I think a lot of people are just happy to support. Like, that's how I am on Patreon. I'm on so many artists' Patreon that I'm like, hello, I would like you to keep making art. Take yeah. my five or 10 bucks a month or whatever yes. it is. Patreon as a platform is not without its flaws, like any large platform, but it is incredibly easy and I like easy and it's starting to get better at being able to organize stuff, which is nice. (laughs) Giving the people who are deeply invested in like my books and like my career and whatnot, a way to support has Mm -hmm. worked out really well. And Kickstarter solely came about because again, I was on Kickstarter as a fan and like, I'm watching these sci-fi fantasy authors like do really interesting things over there. And I was like, romance should be doing that. Like we, and this was kind of in like 2019. So like book boxes were at their height and it was like, God, not every author. Yeah. Can do this or is going to get picked up by one of these boxes and get special editions. Like a lot of people want special editions let's try it with this series that's already proven it can sell which then of course been like what happens with new content like how do we leverage that with new content like what does that look like it's very different than selling special editions of a popular series but it's it's definitely been kickstarter is incredibly innovative and they're actually making moves like they're looking at when i launched my initial kickstarter the head of like outreach for publishing comments like reached out to me and was like how do we make this more attractive for romance because we are underrepresenting romance and like we want the romance community you guys are on the cutting edge of so much stuff we want you on kickstarter and you know since then there's been a lot more projects and and it's people are doing different things which is really cool and kickstarter takes a smaller percentage than amazon i remember you saying that before like first and foremost my rate is better on kickstarter I'm getting a larger yeah. piece of the pie and you're getting it like immediately. Like, you know like what you're getting. Two weeks after. Yeah. yeah, you're getting it. Yeah. What I think that I would love to see more of, and I haven't really had the opportunity to do this myself because I have kind of shifted focus of like, well, my platform's, you know, pretty hefty these days. Like, what if we can bring in more people like, and, you know, do a boost. But I think that sometimes I see authors being like, okay, we're just going to release, you know, or do special editions, whatever of these five books. And then I'm going to retail the sixth book. And I'm like, put the sixth book on Kickstarter, give it early. People will, people will show up, especially your hardcore fans. And then you can still put it retail after the fact, like it just is a pre-order campaign. (laughs) Yeah. It's a pre-order campaign and it's not competitive in a way that the the current terms of service are just disallowing. I had the advantage of like, working with Jenny Norbeck and Melody Carlisle. Um, and like, we had issues with the first one where like, how do you delivery is a problem? Like this other stuff's a problem. And Kickstarter is like, cool. Do you want to intro to the CEO of book funnel? And I'm like, yeah, actually yeah. I do. And it, he was like, yeah, absolutely. This is a problem. Here's this thing that I, a friend of mine did that like worked out really well and we can make this work for you. And, and then we went back to Kickstarter and like, how do we make this work? And it was just like, the innovation is really nice to see because a lot of times, you know, Amazon or like these other companies are like, this is how it is. Deal with it. And they don't answer and the so phone. so to be like, no, or they're like, they're not the connecting computer you. will answer you. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's going to accuse you of stealing your cover art. Now, you mentioned one of the ways in which to innovate on Kickstarter with new material is to put up the prior books and then do a pre-order, a special pre-order or a special edition of the new book that's just for that. What are some other ways that you've explored with new material on Kickstarter? And if you don't want to talk about it, I have other oh, questions. No, <laughs> I'm super happy to. I, I I would love for people to benefit from my mishaps or my knowledge, like, you know, because we've put in a lot of work over we're now on our fourth campaign, like, or I'm on my fourth campaign and the third campaign for bonkers. And it's really interesting to see the differences with like new content because people don't necessarily have the emotional attachment to art the way they do with like stories they've already read. Yeah. Um, but the shared world really seems to be hitting. Like it, it's just having multiple authors in the same setting or I, I think it would be really interesting. I think people have done it by trope of like, these are all like friends to lovers romances. 
And like, if you have a good compilation of authors who have similar enough writing styles or story structure or heat levels or what have you, I, I think the crossover works well. I don't, I think that the shared world or having a group is a really great way to alleviate some of the pressure of like, if it's only me and nobody shows up for me, but Kickstarter is so adaptable that you could do new content. You can release stuff. You could do audiobooks. I've seen authors like fundraise for audiobooks. And of course there's swag or I think V.E. Schwab, either that or their publisher just did one. It was like just the book with like a slightly fancier edition, like some art and stuff. There's really like the sky's the limit. And the beauty is, is that you set your own goals. So you can run a campaign for like $2,000 and that's still successful. Like that's not, it doesn't have to be $44 million, Brandon Sanderson. Um, The GDP of a bunch of countries. Oh my God. Doesn't he have a house that's just for fulfillment purposes? Like there's a separate property that is a house that he bought that is just for fulfilling all of the boxes and stuff. He did. I think he must have a warehouse at this point. Like Has the sheer to. number, like it's staggering and honestly a little overwhelming because we, and that's something that like people really need to take into account is don't overcomplicate things because the fulfillment can be a nightmare if you're not careful. And it's it like it's better to under promise and over deliver than the other way around. Oh yeah. That's why um, my first swag that I did for sale on the site was stickers because I can put all of the mailing equipment in one of those back of the door like shoe organizers and it's like sticker, 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 stamp, stamp, card, bag, envelope, done. Like it doesn't take up a lot yeah. of room. Whereas if I was selling t-shirts, I'd have to find a place to put all those t-shirts because obviously I want to do a wide range of sizes and then I got to figure out how, where to buy, I got to put them and how am I going to start? Yeah, it's a big old thing. That's, we, I want to do t-shirts and I have not branched out into it just because of that to be inclusive and to like, you'd almost have to have the equipment yourself to like do the screen pressing. And then it's like, that's a whole ass business. I am not prepared to do that. Although my husband's like down with it. Yeah, there's a little book thing yeah. you can do. Yeah, just a, it's a small little book thing. <laughs> but also, I think, for example, I have been guilty of underestimating what would be appealing. Like, for example, I remember thinking, why would anyone pay for a print edition of a web comic that they can read for free on their phone? Like, I don't get it. But then I realized I am not the audience for the print edition. I am not, that is, I am not the audience. It doesn't mean that just because I'm not in it. That doesn't mean that audience does exist. And who oh, damn, howdy does that audience exist? Oh, yeah. And sometimes, like, I've backed, I think, three now for Let's Play, the webcomic Let's Play. Yes. Um, I read it all on, like, for free and not even the advanced, like, unlock chapters, just straight up for free. But I wanted to have it on my shelves, on yeah. my trophy shelf. And it's, yeah, it's it's very interesting. I think that... Like Jenny and I have a lot of conversations because she's not a stuff person. Like she's like swags kind of like whatever. And so if I can get her to be like, oh, that's interesting. I I may I might want that. Then you're on to something. Then I know that I'm on to something. Yeah. So it's but it's we do a lot of like market research of like this isn't something that I care about, but like obviously people do care about it. And so maybe that's something we need to look into. As I like to tell authors, because it makes everyone uncomfortable to do money stuff and to charge things and to put prices on things. And everybody wants to undervalue themselves and their work. Your readers and your consumers are grownups with grownup money and they can make their grownup decisions. And if you're not forcing anyone to pay any sort of money, it's great to have some affordable options. I would also really recommend having a couple pie in the sky tiers that, you know, are more expensive enough to make you uncomfortable because somebody might pay it and be happy. Like you just don't know, you don't know other people's spending habits at times. And it's, I, it's something that I is a challenge for me. Uh, <laughs> Cause I'm usually like, no, like let's do bare minimum profit. And that's something that working with other authors or cause we're the project managers. And then we have four authors that they just write the books and like, we provide the promo stuff for them and they just have to promo and like write the book and that's yeah. it. Um, we do everything else. So knowing that they are getting profit from 
how we are setting things up helps me to be a little more reasonable with the, with the pricing on things to be like, yeah. no, like we, I do have to like provide profit for these people who have put their trust in me. Yeah, for sure. Now, I did want to ask you, changing tax just a little bit, a lot of your books come up under the very popular term romanticy, which I will now only say without rolling the arcs, it makes it fun. And if, I don't know if you saw, I, was, I got to be in the Washington Post talking about romanticy this past week. And um, it was very fun to be like, this has existed for a very long time under lots and lots of different names. And now it has a new title and portmanteaus are great. And we're really lucky that it's not phantom ants. Could have been phantom ants, but no, it's not. <laughs> it could have been. Yeah. You've been writing fantasy romance, fantasy, romanticy for a long time. And obviously the genre goes back to like the 80s and the 70s and the 60s and the big yeah. heyday of, of fantasy. There was there was always romance girl cooties. I'm sorry. There was always romance cooties. Always. Always romance cooties. We are everywhere. What are your thoughts on the new title for the familiar genre? I would really love to know your perspective because you are an established author in this field and people have lots of feelings about the romanticy title. I, I mean, it's one of those things that like if it helps people find books, I don't have a problem with it. Like I'm not precious about that stuff because like, you know, like you said, we're around long enough. You see you know, urban fantasy is now contemporary fantasy. Like they all have, it's everything that's old is new again. Who wears the um, leather pants? This is the question. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The one thing that I'm finding interesting about that particular label is that it seems like it's, it seems like when it was first coined, it was ev on everything. It was like, this is romanticy. This is romanticy. This is romanticy. And now at least on the publisher side of things, they're starting to pull back a little bit because readers are looking for a very specific reading experience when they're promised romanticy. And it isn't necessarily fantasy romance or romantic fantasy. It's something like, I'm really curious to see how it develops because I think that at this point, reader expectation is like, it's going to have spice. It's going to be possibly one, maybe only two points of view but it's going to follow the same set of characters across multiple books which is yeah that's hard yeah so it's going to be interesting to see if that narrow definition sticks or if it broadens as time goes on um i'm deeply curious because you know i cut that's what i cut my teeth on when i found fantasy in like 13 14 was essentially what is romantic fantasy now and so I don't know. It's gonna be really interesting. I, I find this stuff very fascinating because I try to guess what's going to happen. And most of the time I'm wrong, but oh, yeah. I like seeing the rhythms of trends. And it's and it's a weird trend, right? Because if you've been here long enough, you're like, oh, you mean like this book and this other book and this other book? Yeah. I actually had a really interesting conversation with Amanda, my assistant, because I mentioned um, Cresley Cole and Nalini Singh and Jennifer Armand Trout and Jennifer Estep as writing series that would qualify as romanticy, yep. especially if you're talking about the fact that it's going to follow a set of protagonists. Like the Archangel series has drifted out, but those are the same people. Um, and Amanda disagreed that Linalini Singh is romanticy. She said, that's paranormal. And there really does seem to be a vibe between some readers saying, no, this is paranormal and this is romanticy and those are not the same thing and it's important to make that distinction. I'm fascinated by what things will be called next. Yeah, because I've actually gotten pushback for my pirate series, which like Blood on the Tides, the second book of being like, that's not romanticy. And I was like, it's not. Why would like, it not it be? Why would it not just be? Just because it's it's it, because it's a different couple in each one or something. I don't, it's, I'm not entirely, it, and it's one of those things that's like, it's not, and we can't exactly tell you why. And I'm like, okay, like, this is interesting. This, this is, is interesting. like the opposite of porn. I know it when I'm not seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I, I definitely understand as far as Nalini Singh goes, because her books really feel like, and it might just be because they're so city based. Like, I think that, but you could say that of a lot of the popular romantic. I don't know. It's very interesting. I'm there. I don't have a definitive answer. It's like watching it be defined in real time. And when you yes. mentioned like what readers are looking for when they're looking for romanticy, sorry, romanticy is a very specific thing. It's also, I think it tends to edge a little towards dark versus cozy, more yeah. angst than warm and fuzzy. And that's why you have the cozy fantasy romances being marketed very separately, cozy romance versus romanticy, because romanticy seems to have an element of 
angst and drama and big, big feels, large feels, well, big like feels. The morally gray hero and the heroine feels a specific way. I, I do think, excuse me, I do think it's going to blow open. Yeah. Like in the next couple of years, as far as d- definitions go. But right now people are like, they almost want, I think it's because like Sarah J. Moss and Jennifer Armantrout's Blood and Ash series and some of the other stuff that's kind of gotten popular in the wake of that all feel very similar in certain components. Yeah. And so that's like, people are like, this is what it is. Um, will it stay that way? I don't know. I don't, I don't know either. It's fun to see something. It's like watching a new island be formed. Like, ooh, what books yeah. are we going to put on this island? Because I don't get a lot of pitches now for paranormal romance or even urban fantasy romance. Those aren't terms that I get pitched to me now. No, it's I see contemporary fantasy. Yep. Um, Cozy fantasy, which like, witch it? fantasy. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So it's 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 deeply interesting because I'm like, back in my day, we called that urban fantasy. And they're like, no, urban fantasy means something specific now and it's not what we called it and it's i don't think it's a bad thing for you know stuff to change but it's it's very interesting on an academic level and it's interesting on a um on a a lexical level like the actual vernacular of how we're describing our genre is something that Mm -hmm. readers increasingly have control over and input in and watching terms be created or identified that aren't coming from corporations, that aren't coming from publicists and houses. It's it's fan-based language. That makes me think of how many authors and publishers now use fanfic tags as standard marketing. Yeah. I mean, I do. I, I started... I love it. Make it clear. I, it's Yeah. And it's also just like, it's fun and it gets people talking and it's yeah. a great promo tool, but also... I feel very strongly about not content warning things between consensual adults, with the exception of a few things like consensual non-consent, because that is a triggering thing. But like, I'm not going to content warn like female, female sex scene or like stuff, because I feel like that kind of puts a ick on it that I don't want to convey. So I find the tags really helpful to like signal flare certain things yeah. that I don't want to consider content warning, but that I do want people aware of whether it's so as a marketing tactic of them being like, yes, I want that a shopping list or just people being like, oh, I'm not certain about like whatever. Um, and so that's, it's a, I think, I mean, if people look at it, I, not everybody looks at it, but I, it's a very useful tool. And I think that it's popular and useful in fanfic for a reason. Oh, for sure. And not only is it popular and useful, but it helps with a problem that I've been looking at in the genre for ages. So way, 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 way back when Smart Bitches was founded, like the middle of the 2000s, we had a campaign with Dear Author called Save the Contemporary because it was dying and there weren't enough. <laughs> so it's fine now. It's, cool. it's doing really well. But one of the problems was when we were talking about contemporary romance, we were talking about a very specific kind of contemporary romance, which probably now would be called rom-com. But Mm -hmm. back then and still now, I could say contemporary romance and be talking about like Debbie Maycomber or Robin, um, Robin Carr. And you could be talking about like the darkest, most angstiest, marginally dubcon mafia. Let's let's make it a mafia biker gang romance that you're talking about. Right. And I'm talking about like bakeries next door to the church. And those are both contemporary romances. but They're not the same thing. The interesting thing, like as far as like dark romance as a sub genre, I think that some dark romance should really be labeled as like erotic horror. Oh, that's um, a good point. I can totally see your reasoning for saying that. Because I think some of the criticisms leveled at like a certain, and some some authors do do that. Like they it, they get ignored, and it's still called dark romance by readers, but they are like labeling. And I think that some of the criticisms about romanticizing abuse, which I could, that's one topic I could talk about for a very long time, um, would not necessarily apply because those expectations come with the label of romance, that they will be inherently redeemable. Whereas if you're in like erotic horror or or something that's like kissing cousins, but not quite the same, would you still get those criticisms? Absolutely. But like, you don't see those against horror writers the way you do against romance writers. And, you know, I think that 
that's but like my well I've, I've been increasing love of horror over the last couple of years and so it's got me really thinking about like labels and like how horror and romance can really interact with each other oh, in like yes. interesting ways and i think dark romance is a really great example of that but the romance label sometimes catches people up because they feel like romance should be prescriptive which i don't agree with but oh no you know people will feel their way <laughs> It's interesting to to hear you say that you've been reading a lot more horror because you're not the only person I've interviewed who's like, I'm reading a lot of horror. Like, and I'm like, well, that that makes sense. Horror and romance have a lot of things in common. I did a whole interview with Chuck Tangle where he was like, no, they are. They are cousins. They are. They are they very are. close. And I think like dark romance, some, oh God, who said it? I cannot remember. It was someone on Twitter. I've properly like, not into them in the past of this but it's like something that like dark romance is the perfect child of romance and horror because you get the cathartic intense emotions of horror with the soft landing of of the hea from romance yeah and that but they're they're the same they're both like we both incredibly tropey both yes like are created to bring forth really intense emotions yeah it's just both often having really commentary below the surface level of like the thing happening it's like okay but this is like a metaphor for this other thing that's happening and and both are kind of shit on by most literary people <laughs> yeah looking at my notes from my interview with chuck which i just pulled up and that was in august of 2023 for camp damascus um, he sees romance, horror, and comedy as matching genres because they create a physical response as opposed to an intellectual response. They create a, a response in the body and Im- emotional. Like horror makes you scared. Romance yeah. can make you horny or, or or tender or emotional and comedy makes you laugh. Like those are all physical responses to what you're reading, which is very different from a, oh, I'm having a think about this. That's a different response. And I think he's right about that. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, and all three of those are really hard to do. Yeah. Like it's, it's so they hard. seem easy. Like, oh, I'll just tell a scary story. I'll just write a smutty book. But like, it's hard to elicit those emotions and the people that are, excuse me, reading or listening or viewing your story if you're not really good at your craft. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty, vi- pretty visible. Now, I always ask this question What are some books that you're reading right now? that you would uh, like to tell people about. And if you don't have any books to talk about now, because I understand sometimes writers go through periods where they're not reading. If there are books that were foundational to you as a writer that like you could go back to any time, I would also accept that list. I mean, just name books. It's fine. I, I'm i on like this intense winner after winner reading of on right now, which is really scary because it means eventually it'll end. But victory. I, yes, I'm so happy um, for on, you. On book tour, I finally picked up Legendborn. A lot of times when books get really hyped, I get this like resistance to picking up because I'm certainly it won't live up. Oh, yes, it did. It did. And then some. And then I read the second book, which was even better, even better. Phenomenal. Now I have to wait for the third and I'm bummed. Like probably one of the most unique angles I've seen on like the King Arthur like mythos. Yeah. And and then I... um I'm a huge Stephen Graham Jones fan. Like mm. I had read the only good Indians a couple years ago and like it haunted me and I could not figure out why it haunted me. And like, it made me scared to pick up more of his books. Um, Cause I just could not like define what it was that like made that story sit with me so much. Yep. And so then I, I, but I read um, the first two in the Jay Daniels trilogy and like, I love slashers even before I like my horror renaissance that I'm in right now. Like I've always loved slashers scream in particular. That franchise is a favorite of mine or was and he is. Um, and so like I read the first two books and I was like, holy shit balls. Like this is, it's a love song to slashers. The character work that he's doing is phenomenal. And like the third one I think comes out in April. And so I got rejected on net galley for it. And so I, message or like emailed my publicist and I was like could you do you know anybody over there like could you give me this book I'm gonna talk about I'm gonna talk about so much because I cannot stop talking about it and the first two books sorry we are in this fandom right now the first two books are third point of view right um 
the third one's in first. Oh, and that's a that that's a that's a switch. It it's so intentional and such. I had to keep stopping it because I was kept crying because like the character work that he does with Jade, who's this was starts the series as a child who has been like, you know, harmed in such grievous ways and like whose community has kind of failed her into her stepping into this adult role of one of the people that she really valued as a teenager, as a 17 year old to becoming like the mother that she didn't have because her mother failed her but like that strength of what that looks like and that like maybe final girl isn't a un like a single thing maybe there's a final girl in a lot of us and like it was so beautiful and like just ruined me it ruined me in the best way possible it ended really hopeful so if anybody's worried about that it ends really hopeful no spoilers um and then i couldn't read because how how do how do i go from there and my friend Nisha Sharma was like, Katie, you need to read this book. Um, you make a fool of death with your beauty. And I was like, all right, I'm going to pick it up. I don't know. I can't promise that I'm going to re- like get through it because I'm in a hell of a book hangover and I'm almost done with it. And it is, again, the most beautiful book. Like it's messy and human and sexy, not spicy, but sexy. Yeah. And like, just this gorgeous tale of her finding herself in a way that like is selfish, but also like she deserves to be selfish Mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, so yeah, I'm just floored and, um, I don't know what I'm going to do when I finish this book. (laughs) Probably, probably go watch a show or something. I don't know. But as far as like foundational texts that like left their imprints on my soul, um, Kushiel's legacy series by Jacqueline Carey, which is, I would argue, romanticy. Like it's, I it's, completely agree. In the original draft of my WAPO article, I talked about how Kushiel's dart got Cassiel's servant last year. That it has a new, yeah. updated, alternate point of view story. Like that's very much romanticy, okay. especially the erotic part. Just, oh my gosh! And it's like, and it's queer in a way that's just so matter of fact that like you didn't really find very often at the time when that was originally published um but i read it like pro- too early to fully understand every element of what i was reading and was just like this is the greatest thing i've ever ever gotten my hands on um and bishop's black jewels trilogy and oh, yeah. the various short stories that go with it is i'm like on this perpetual quest to find books that have that balance of like really dark content but also whimsy like C.L. Wilson's Terrence Soul series is very similar tonally, but you don't see that combination all that often. No, that was um, very unique. Yeah. And just like, I reread that series probably once a year, like around Christmas time. And again, and it got a new cover to go with the romantic, the romantic label. And it went from a very art style clinch cover to, yeah. I think I described it in the article as either something in bass relief or something on fire or encased in ice or in this case all three yes sometimes it's a dagger I, just a <laughs> knife just stabbing it yeah yeah um and then the like third part of the trifecta is alona andrews this kate daniels series oh goodness because yeah. which again that's i reread these series all the time like at least probably once a year but like in a time when urban fantasy at the time, what that was called, uh, they really did something unique with that series that like all most, at least the series I was reading, which is not exhaustive of the list, but the ones I was reading that were really popular at the time, it's like each book got darker and darker and she's more isolated and it's, it's bad. She's, you know, 10 degrees below hell at this point. And the K Daniel series the stakes were raised because she had more people around her she cared about yeah. and more people that she could. So she built a community and that's what raised the stakes, which was very unique at that time. Yeah. And it's like, I, they're one of the authors or set of author. They're, they're the authors. Like it's like, I, I don't care what you write. I will yeah. purchase it. Like, I'm not going to write you to ask when the next few books coming out. I will be patient. But just know that I'm waiting. <laughs> yeah. I love the 
I love books that like play with the concept of home, that like creating a home mm-hmm. that is a sanctuary is a very important skill and it's underappreciated. Also, most commonly div- like expected of women. I love the Innkeeper series because it's like, not only do we have to make a place that is a home, it's like an inn, like people are going to sleep here, but it has to be neutral and everyone has to be safe. And that's I love hard. The territory. And it's the Innkeeper series, they do a really good job of like setting as character. Yeah. Which is something that I'm relatively recently getting into. Like, obviously, gothic novels do that really well. Um, and Ryan Lasella's Honey, The Honeys, did setting as character, like, just phenomenally. Um, it's like summer camp kind of situation, like rich people summer camp. But it's like, I'm like, I can feel the sticky air on my skin, mm-hmm. like, hear the buzz of the bee. Like, it, yep. you know, it's just excellent. All right. Where can people find you if you wish to be found? If you wish to be not found, you do not have to be found. <laughs> um, I am in an increasingly tumultuous relationship with social social media. You so don't say. I, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm currently right now at this moment on Instagram threads and TikTok. But should I ever disappear from there? I have a newsletter that goes out approximately weekly and it's mostly just like irreverent silly stuff what i'm reading various announcements that i'm required to make um (laughs) what's going on in my life but mostly what i'm reading because i like to like that brings me joy to be like you let me shove this book in your hands yes let me tell you about this book i have a whole website that that's basically why it exists because i wanted to yes exactly And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Thank you, as always, to Katie Robert for connecting with me, as busy as she is. As I mentioned, I will have links to all of the books that we talked about, and I will have links to her website, and I will have links to the other Patreons she mentioned as well. I end each episode with a terrible joke, and this week would be no exception. I would never leave you hanging. This joke is from Laura B., and I love it so much. Why was Cinderella so bad at soccer? Give up? Why was Cinderella so bad at soccer? She kept running away from the ball. (laughs) I can hear you groaning. Like sometimes I grab a joke from the Discord or I find one online and I'm like, oh, it's so bad. Thank you, Laura B. On behalf of everyone here, we wish you the very best of reading. Have a wonderful weekend. We will see you back here next week. Smart Podcast Trashy Books is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more outstanding podcasts to subscribe to at frolic.media slash podcasts. Podcasts.